Okay, I think uh, everyone is here who's going to be here. Um, so we'll get started. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in uh, Warsaw. Um, lovely time last night. I, um, I've had less fun at weddings. <laughs> um, we're here to talk about um, our uh, fault-aware global server load balancer that we do in uh, DNS um, that we use for uh, our CDN. Um, just a few words uh, about uh, who our target audience is uh, for this talk. If you have an organization that has more than one uh, point of presence, um, it's for you. Uh, if you or your application would benefit from a geographic segmentation of traffic, um, if you could use the ability to deploy simple failover, uh, active-passive, or multi-node uh, load balancing uh, of your traffic. Um, do you want your server monitoring to automatically update your DNS? You probably do. Um, GDNSD is the uh, uh, subject of uh, this talk. Um, we uh, put in a port. Um, as our contribution, um, and basically wrote this talk proposal uh, on the train back from uh, BSD CAN uh, last May. Um, did the port uh, uh, up uh, in the summer. Um, GDNSD was originally built by a programmer uh, working at Logitech, and uh, he got them to open source it, uh, which was nice. Um, so they used it to manage directing users to nearby uh, driver download mirrors, uh, and works nicely. Okay, a little bit about us. We're the scale engine guys. Um, we're a CDN. Um, this I'm is Alan. Alan Jude. I've been a FreeBSD admin for quite a while. i uh, built all the architecture stuff at Scale Engine, including our CDN and the video streaming network. Uh, before that, I was a professor at Mohawk College teaching computer science and IT, and then uh, I host a podcast called TechSnap, which is uh, the Systems Network and Admin podcast. So if you're into that, it might be interesting. And um, I've been a BSD server admin for a long time. Um, I did the Varnish uh, implementation for the Toronto Star newspaper uh, in those exciting times in 2009. Um, and I've taught a lot uh, as well in Canada. Um, and uh, I guess... Uh, this is the story of how we came to use this uh, uh, GSLB. Um, so just an overview of what we're going to talk about. Uh, we'll give you an introduction to what we do. Um, uh, talk about some of the challenges we've had with, uh, with growth as uh, people have started using us uh, to carry their, their, uh, their traffic. Um, we'll discuss what is a global server load balancer, um, examine some of the currently available uh, solutions, um, both proprietary and, uh, and non-proprietary. Um, and uh, of course, we prefer the uh, open source solution. Uh, that's why we're here. Um, and then we'll uh, get into uh, the actual GDNSD uh, implementation, and Alan will walk you through uh, um, an example. So combining uh, the port uh, with uh, this talk and the slides uh, uh, should get you set up um, pretty nicely. Um, we're going to look at uh, response policy. Uh, in other words, what do you do uh, uh, when, when a client does a lookup? Okay, so what, what's the DNS server going to say? Um, advanced response policies with uh, GeoIP, so making it geo, uh, geographically aware. Um, use cases and uh, examples. Um, agents monitoring. Um, adding capacity, in other words, on-demand capacity uh, based on what's happening uh, in DNS. Um, the eDNS client subnet implementation and uh, challenges uh, therein, um, and uh, workarounds for uh, it, what you have to do if you're not on the white list. <laughs> uh, okay, what is a scale engine? Um, it's a global CDN. Well, it is now. Um, we do uh, a lot of video streaming. Um, we do a lot of uh, HTTP objects. Um, and we do some application hosting. Um, we are entirely powered by FreeBSD and uh, have been um, for many years. 
Um, this, so we do a number of things. We have edge side caching, um, and uh, that's a, a varnish implementation. Um, a, a CDN um, uh, for global caching of anything uh, over HTTP. Um, anything else? Uh, VSN is a video streaming, um, so it's live streaming for events and uh, on-demand um, streaming uh, to uh, desktop uh, using uh, RTMP and to uh, mobile devices, uh, lots of iPads and iPhones and Androids and so on, um, mostly with uh, HLS uh, using uh, uh, the uh, Cupertino chunking. Um, we also have a, an origin web cluster, OWC, which is uh, uh, PHP, MySQL, My MySQL mostly. Um, and of course, we have the, uh, the GSLB that, that powers it. Um, you want to uh, talk about that? Yeah, we have, uh, at the moment, we have about 70 servers spread across 25 different data centers in nine different countries. Uh, and so balancing the load between those and, and dealing with failures that happen uh, started to become much more administrative headache, and we looked at ways to automate it. Uh, and in aggregate, we can push about 50 gigabits per second uh, up to the internet uh, between those different hosts, all of which run FreeBSD 9 and are managed with uh, Puppet. Thank you to Edward Tan for introducing us to that. <laughs> uh, and uh, we also make extensive uses of, of jails with uh, Easy Jail to make it easier to uh, deploy the same containerized config for some of our applications on those different hosts and to uh, move things between hosts when required. Well, and, we do, uh, let's know, do a little bit of stats. Um, the, the main... Uh, the biggest one is that in the last... In September, we uploaded about 200 terabytes to the internet. Uh, at peak time, that was about 18 gigabits per second. Um, and <laughs> and uh, our uh, varnish serves about uh, five, or this month it'll be about six billion requests, uh, but at peak time that's as many as 5,000 requests per second that we spread across the different geo zones. Um, as everyone knows, the varnish can do that with its eyes closed on one box, but the challenge is actually locating it around the world. Um, so yeah, we push a fair amount of bits. Um, in, in terms of video, uh, we have very spiky event-driven traffic where we see in a space of five minutes, things go from 100 megabits to 10 gigabits. Um, video is a low request rate um, situation. Um, extremely high bandwidth, sometimes one, one and a half megabit. Um, to each client, uh, and the sessions are long-lived. Um, so that's where we see our peak um, network load. Um, in comparison, uh, HTTP is uh, smooth. It tends to follow when people are awake. Um, our largest uh, CDN uh, HTTP object uh, uh, client is runs on lots and lots of news sites, and so, you know, People read the Lunch news. Time is the busiest time. People read the news when they're at work, so the graph goes up when they're, <laughs> when they're at work, and, and, and that's how it goes. Okay. There's a graph of it coming up. Yeah, we'll have a graph of that. Um, so yeah, uh, we, we started a CDN um, kind of out of, out of necessity, and this is a few years ago, and we were just doing hosting, um, and one of our hosting customers quadrupled in size, so, so yay. Um, but we were on a fixed commit at an expensive North American hosting provider. And we had a very modest 10 megabit commit, and we could burst to 100. Um, but we're going to like max it out with this suddenly large customer. So um, we had to get creative. We, had to, we have limitations. That's fine. And you use that to get better, or you die. Um, so you can get servers from cheaper providers. Um, and uh, we did that. Uh, they had cheaper network, um, in some cases better network, um, and uh, we just created a subdomain, instant CDN. Uh, so your image content is offloaded, uh, and uh, we were able to push out enough to uh, avoid uh, expensive overage charges on, on premium transit. 
Um, so a little bit about HTTP and subdomains. Uh, your modern browsers will parallel download if you serve content uh, from additional domains. So that's good. Uh, right. uh, like normally, a browser will only connect to the same site two or three times to download objects, and then any objects after that get queued. But if you make all the CSS come from one subdomain, the JavaScript from another domain, and images from a couple of other domains, or even subdomains, it'll start loading more of them at once. And since most people have a broadband connection now, and it's more the latency that's limiting this loading speed rather than the, the transfer rate, we can load more of the page at once and be finished sooner. Um, so this will improve speed if the user is reasonably close geographically to the server. And uh, conversely, it will not improve speed. It will make it worse if the user is far away from the uh, server. Um, you get the ability to strip cookies, um, which can uh, uh, speed up user experience. Um, and uh, it just lets us cache popular content. It's kind of on demand. And that's the beauty of Varnish. Um, here's your typical HTTP graph. So people are all awake um, in the middle of the day and looking at news. And they go to sleep in the middle of the night, and nobody reads the news. Uh, and it's interesting to watch those graphs uh, across the geographically distributed servers because the, the hump in the graph is offset at different times depending on where the server is. Um, so uh, the challenge is that uh, it, just creating a couple of C names for a, a subdomain is uh, suboptimal. Um, and it uh, quickly becomes cumbersome uh, to manage this uh, on a large scale. Um, users don't benefit from any geographic awareness uh, with just straight, for, straight round robin DNS. Um, we also found that some resolvers were sorting results alphabetically, so we couldn't really point people at a domain anyway. An IP that starts with a one always got more traffic. <laughs> um, so we're benefiting by offloading network, right? Yeah, yes, but uh, user experience is, is not as good as we want. So um, here's just part of growing pains, right? So your, your, your business is starting to... Uh, uh, get used, and uh, you need to sort some, sort some things out. Um, external providers are cheaper for bandwidth um, and uh, sold in large amounts, which is what we need. Um, right, but also they sold us trans, uh, transfer per terabyte of transfer rather than 95th percentile. So it meant that for our bursty type of traffic, it was much easier to get what we wanted for a reasonable price. Um, so you want to talk about what And uh, the other advantage with going with a bunch of separate external providers was that we could get different locations instead of having to have a co-location and try to manage that at all the different points on the globe, right? So now we don't have, we have two racks in our data center near our offices, but we have nine other data centers around the globe where we, or sorry, 25 other data centers around the globe where we have servers. Uh, and then that means that we cover more of the globe with a server near them, but also we're having a lot of different transit providers that way, so that there's one that's topographically close to you on the internet. There's some where there's peering near you. Uh, so you also get better connection that way and more uh, diverse. So um, the early uh, struggles with this uh, were to uh, um, manually uh, manage DNS, mm, suboptimal. Uh, used uh, bind views, um, which uh, in inflated uh, the uh, size of the zone. Uh, a lot. Well, it was, I basically took a GeoIP database and summarized the subnets into larger blocks and made access lists out of those and then defined them as different views. So I had uh, views for different regions like East Coast, West Coast, Europe, Asia, and so on. And then each of those would have to have a separate zone file in bind uh, with different records. So when you went to this website, if you fell into this zone, then you were sent to this IP. And if you fell into this zone, you went to a different IP. Uh, but you know, when one of those servers goes down, it was you had to edit the zone files and mark it, and it was cumbersome to manage it all the time, and uh, it often took too long. Um, we thought about doing AnyCast, um, it, but our core expertise is uh, with uh, server applications, um, and we also had providers that were frankly uh, reluctant uh, to do that with us. Um, the, our basic technique uh, then uh, initially is to uh, add IPs more than once into um, uh, a record. 
uh, in DNS. Um, and that uh, just compounds problems because you run into the uh, DNS uh, size response limit. Um, so eDNS0, um, the original uh, RFC, uh, stated that uh, if a uh, response is larger than 512 bytes, you return it over TCP, not uh, UDP. Um, in 99, uh, eDNS0 was introduced and allowed for DNS responses uh, up to 4,096 bytes over UDP with fragmentation. Yeah, and uh, the problem with that is it basically your server will only return a, response, a larger response over UDP if the client requests it. So that clients that don't support it wouldn't uh, be sent a response they wouldn't understand. Uh, the problem is some older firewalls will have rules that say if the DNS response is more than 512 bytes, block it. Uh, but the client behind that doesn't know that that's there, and so requests the response to be sent with eDNS zero. So it asks for a larger response, but then some intermediary firewall would block the response on the way back. Cisco and, ASAs. Yes. <laughs> And so they wouldn't get the response that they asked for, uh, whereas if they hadn't set the flag, we would have sent the response in a way that would have got through the firewall. But because the client was requesting a feature that technically was being blocked somewhere in front of the client, it resulted in when our uh, DNS responses got too big when we were at like 20 servers in uh, North America, it meant that all of a sudden some clients, uh, mostly at corporations, and since news sites are mostly browsed by people at work, uh, all of a sudden they couldn't resolve the domain. And we couldn't figure out why at first, and then we found out about these evil firewalls. Telling them to install PFSense didn't work. So. <laughs> um, so we start getting a lot of requests to do video streaming, and we start playing around with it. Um, we get a lot of these requests from Europe. Um, entirely different scaling problems now with video, it becomes link capacity uh, that is the issue. Yeah, 100 um, megabit servers are not good enough anymore. Yeah, so you have to have uh, gigabit uh, uplinks. Um, you need uh, providers with lots of bandwidth, and hey, that's Europe. Um, surprise, bandwidth is even cheaper in Europe. Um, some providers have uh, better transit than others uh, to uh, North America, we learned. Um, y your scaling is completely unpredictable uh, with video um, compared to HTTP, so you don't have those nice smooth graphs. There's no trend, it's just all of a sudden there's something and all of a sudden it's gone. Yeah, um, the other uh, technical issue is that uh, you, you, you cannot have contention uh, for, for the wire in video. Uh, if you do that, it breaks the experience for everyone. Right, like with HTTP, if you have a demand for bandwidth greater than your 100 megabits or whatever, then everybody will just get this file they're downloading just slower. But with video, if you're using most of your gigabit, uh, and everybody's getting the video at one and a half megabits or whatever, and they're happy, and then you add a couple more users, and you all of a sudden push over that limit of how much you can push through that line, now all 1,000 people that are trying to watch have their live stream stuttering and breaks. Yeah. So uh, TCP you, tries you, to be helpful and just breaks everything well, for Or everybody. even UDP would have the same problem now. So as, as soon as you hit that limit, you're not just slowing everybody down or something, or you're not just having a problem for the new people connecting, you basically ruin the experience for everyone connected to that server as soon as you try to exceed the link capacity. Okay, so uh, example, news, sports, and so on. Um, one day there was an airport emergency in Iceland, so the whole country went and visited the state broadcaster. We carry the video for them. And yeah, we carry all foreign video for ruv.is, and uh, an airplane had a broken landing gear or something and couldn't land. had to circle the airport for four hours and burn off fuel. And apparently there was like 10,000 people trying to watch this video, live stream of this happening. And it was just unprecedented scaling challenge for us. Um, so uh, we needed to factor uh, geography into the load balancing. Um, it was very important, though, to not send viewers to overloaded servers, okay? And this is why we, we start doing it out of DNS. Um, like, the, the first load balancing solution we tried was one that was based on the number of viewers on each server. So it just knew how many people were watching videos on each different server and would just send the next viewer to the least loaded server. But not everybody's watching the same video. Some videos are lower bit rate, some of them are only audio. So that meant that just because that server had fewer viewers didn't mean it had more available bandwidth. And so we had to work out something more intelligent than that. 
Yeah. So we have to measure network and application health before we send someone uh, to a server, and this this lets us do that. And here's your here's your spiky spiky video graph, and um, here's your very very spiky video graph. Um, so yeah, people it, just, just it very sharp. It just goes from nothing to 800 plus megabits out of nowhere. Okay, so um, what's a global server load balancer? Um, it handles the direction of traffic to different nodes with a focus on geolocation. And depending on the vendor, there's a bunch of talk, hand waving and cliches uh, about uh, high availability and, uh, and optimal response time. Um, in our case, uh, our global server load balancer routes traffic to edge servers near the request store uh, to provide lower latency uh, and to spread load uh, between a number of data centers, that's important for us, um, as well as automatically uh, diverting traffic from down servers. Whether it's down, meaning you're you're maxed out, you're at your 800. We're not sending anybody more to you. Uh, the hard drive gave out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we first looked at what was out there. There's a bunch of different commercial solutions like your F5s and Barracudas and so on. Uh, the Barracuda, though, required that we have a Barracuda device at each different location. Uh, and when you make a configuration change, there's no way to have that replicated. You have to manually load the new configuration on each of the devices. Uh, and that wasn't very helpful. And it meant that it really couldn't be automated. Uh, and also the response policies we could come up with were quite limited. It was basically we can decide on by region or geo IP, but that was about it. Uh, and yeah, there was no auto updating. And also the monitoring was fairly limited. A lot of times it was just, is this port open? Rather than, can you actually check this, the health of the application? It, it's actually completely limited. Um, in, in terms of what you can do with this, with GDNSD, um, GDNSD just blows away that particular uh, proprietary solution. Um, and it's expensive. Um, okay, open yeah, source. So uh, we looked at what was available open source, and originally we tried bind with views, uh, basically summarize the subnets into a smaller set because otherwise it would have eaten all of the RAM on the machine. Uh, as it was, it was pretty heavy to have all these uh, huge ACLs with different uh, CIDR subnets. Uh, and it also made it take about 60 seconds to reload the bind config, uh, and it required a separate bind config for each different zone. And as we kept adding more zones, it just became even more cumbersome to manage. And uh, the worst part was that it broke master-slave replication. Because when you do an AXFR, the slave would get the copy of the zone for whatever region it happened to fall in, whichever view it was in. It wouldn't get all of the views. So then we had to come up with our own way to, to push the zones out and update the serial numbers and so on. Uh, we looked at Power DNS, uh, which is basically a, something like Bind, except for the, the storage backend is usually something like MySQL. Uh, but its GOIP thing doesn't read the MaxMind files that we have. They took some other format for a DNS block list. Uh, and then we looked at Anycast, but it kind of had some limited flexibility. It wasn't application aware unless we ran like OpenVGPD on each machine and had some helper script or something to withdraw the route if our app wasn't healthy, and only a third of our providers were willing to establish a BGP session with each of our servers. Uh, so I did a little chart here showing uh, the different things. And the other thing was that uh, the eDNS client subnet is not supported in bind uh, when I looked. I don't know. It might be better now. Uh, PowerDNS didn't really support it yet either. Uh, and so basically, GDNSD, uh, we found when we were looking for something that supported eDNS. Uh, so what the global server de load balancer does is we have a situation like this where our US viewers are being directed to a US server, UK, Germany, and France, or whatever. And then the, the load balancer is monitoring each of those servers and checking its health. When it detects that the French server all of a sudden doesn't have a connection to the internet anymore or is down or whatever, then the French viewers are actually redirected to the next closest server or whatever business rules we've applied through the config or response policy. So we send them to Germany. Uh, but then, in a different situation, we have our cluster of servers in the UK, and they're reaching their load limit. They, they can't handle any more viewers without degrading the performance for everyone. 
rather than just sending the viewers to the next closest server, which if we're having a lot of load in one area, it's likely covering the whole region, instead of just sending them to the next closest server and basically knocking that over, and then the, next, the second closest server knocking that over and continuing that, because you know, it's DNS, so there is that little caching delay, we, and our load spikes really, really quickly. As soon as we detect a trend that we're going to overload the UK, we fall back and redirect traffic to the entire region and spread the traffic around all the servers in the region so that we can handle a bigger spike. Yeah, the, so in the uh, example config, which we will get to, you'll see how we uh, define uh, different zones and how to fail. And the, to the stages of, of failing up instead of over. Uh, so GDNSD basically came to the rescue. It's an uh, authoritative only DNS server. It doesn't have all the features, but it has most of what you need. Importantly, it supports eDNS client subnet. Uh, it's a draft specification uh, an engineer at Google came up with. And the basic idea is when you uh, do a DNS lookup, the server doesn't see the client's IP address. They only see the request coming from the recursive DNS server. Uh, and when that was at most people's ISP, that worked pretty well, because the ISP's DNS server would be generally located near the, the customers. But as people started moving to using things like OpenDNS and Google's public DNS, uh, the problem was that geolocation points all of Google's IPs to the Googleplex in California, even if that server happens to be in the Netherlands. And so uh, people would notice things like iTunes use a CDN called Akamai. And if you weren't in California, you would get lower speeds, especially in Europe, because if you're using Google DNS, Akamai saw the request come from Google, so they thought you were in California. So they send all the traffic to the California node that came through Google. Uh, and so eDNS client subnet is an extension that, as part of the DNS request, the recursive server passes along the slash 24 of the client. So not the whole IP address for privacy reasons, but it tells you what subnet the client is in, so you can geolocate based on that rather than the request the recursive DNS server's IP, because normally you wouldn't know what the client IP is in DNS. Uh, it reads the MaxMind GeoIP database directly through the C API, so uh, you can use like uh, GeoLite Cities or or whatever, or you can buy the more expensive one that's more accurate. Uh, it has monitoring plugins that can actually monitor your servers. And importantly, these also include flapping detection. So uh, we'll get into what the rules are like, but it allows you to make sure that a server isn't going up and down constantly. Because if it is, there's probably something wrong, and you want to back off from that server, not flip on it. And uh, it has a number of different response plugins, plus an API for you to write your own. Uh, so with simple failover, you basically just have a primary and a secondary defined for any response record. And it returns the primary unless it fails, in which case it returns the secondary. With multi-failover, you basically give it a pool of IP addresses, and it spreads the load between those, and removes any of those IPs if they're monitoring reports that they're down. With weighted, you assign each of the servers in a pool a weight, and it allows you to have unfair load balancing. Uh, you know, if one of your servers has more capacity than the other, then you want it to get more of the load. And then the Geographic multi-failover is the same thing, except for you use the GeoIP database as well. Uh, it reads basically standard bind zones, so you don't have to rewrite your zone. You just copy it in, uh, but you get a couple of new record types. Importantly, it also let us limit the number of addresses that returned in a response. So it's just a little macro you put in your zone file and say, for this set of records, never return more than four IPs in the response. And that let us make sure our records or our responses were under that 512 byte limit. And uh, there wasn't a port, so we made one. Uh, so the two new record types you get are Dyn A and Dyn C, which are basically dynamic A records and, and C names. Uh, so importantly, being able to do dynamic C names is actually pretty cool. Uh, and it also supports the include macro and the record size limits. So when you're defining a response policy, there's a bunch of things you can consider. Uh, if the failover and the load balancing. Uh, by default, you would just have basically what's called binary node health, just checking if it's up or down. Like it has a HTTP status monitor that checks for a 200 response, but that's about it. Uh, then we kind of had developed more advanced uh, node health checking that actually checks other factors to decide if the server should be a candidate for being returned uh, in a response. 
and then it factors in the location, uh, what nodes to use at what time, and uh, how many nodes to return in each message, right? Do we want to return just one or an RR of two or eight or whatever? So the basic uh, config, probably a little too small to read, but uh, you basically define a uh, service or a, a resource like public uh, www, and then you define your monitoring types and uh, basically a list of IP addresses. It'll check the service on each one of those. Uh, you can even define multiple services, like here, and only if they're all up is uh, the IP a candidate. And then it'll return those three IP addresses, and it can also do IPv6. Uh, you can specify separate monitoring. For example, if your DNS server doesn't support IPv6, or the machine it's on doesn't have a, a v6 address, but some of your services have v6, then you can't monitor the v6 part, so you can make a, a pseudo service that's always up or whatever. Uh, another interesting thing here, it has an up threshold. Uh, basically, as a failover in case something's wrong with the monitoring, uh, or, and it determines that all of your servers are down, rather than not returning anything, uh, you basically set a threshold and you say, in this case, if less than 70% of our servers are up, then it falls back to just returning all the servers, because it assumes something's wrong rather than, it assumes something's wrong with the monitoring rather than something's wrong with all of your servers at once. There's a number of things you run into when you're using uh, GeoIP. Uh, the first one is that the data is not always accurate. Uh, for example, the IP address of our co-location shows up in New York rather than Toronto. So sometimes the country isn't even right, let alone the, the city level or state level. And uh, you know, the same thing was obviously happening with uh, Google's IPs, right? They use Anycast for the address that you interface with, 8.8.8.8 or whatever, but the actual addresses the request comes from are regular unicast IPs, and they're spread all over the world, but all of them geo-IP back to Googleplex. Ah, and yes, and as I said, the source IP that your DNS server sees is that of the recursive resolver, not the client. So you're geolocating the DNS server they're using, not the user. So there's going to be an error in there of how far away the user is from their DNS server. Especially if they're using something like a corporate VPN or something, and it's not good. Yeah. Ah, the other thing is you can, uh, in addition to loading the geo IP database, uh, GDNSD lets you define a list of overrides. Uh, so you can say, you know, for example, our specific subnet for our own internal IPs goes to a specific server all the time, even if the geolocation would send it somewhere else. Uh, so when you're using GeoIP, there's two different methods. The first is the automatic. You basically define a list of your data centers, and then for each one you define the latitude and longitude of the location, and it will geolocate the user and find the closest data center and return that. Uh, and then you can see you can do overrides. We can say, you know, our subnet always goes to Toronto. And you can see here, we have a common separated list of data centers. It'll try the first one, and then only if all the servers in that are down, it'll then fall over to the second one, and so on. And you can have an unlimited length of that list. In a more advanced configuration, we define a list of our data centers, and then we do a map from the GeoIP's uh, database's actual geolocation. Yeah, that's in the automatic one, and that's why we have this more advanced one where you can be more specific, right? You can have specific subnets be override to a certain location, or you can have other stuff. But mostly we were just worried about not serving users from Europe in North America and North America in Europe, because why go transatlantic when you don't have to? That cuts 80 milliseconds off, and that's a big difference. So in this one, you can... You can even drill down to the city level if your GeoIP uh, data is good enough. Uh, and in addition, you can also do subnets if you have specific places that are having a problem. So in this case, we say for Africa, use the European data centers. For Asia, use the Asian data center, but we don't have very many of those, so fall over to the backup pool. For Europe, we have a default of a, a pool of all our servers in Europe, but we have specific data centers in Germany, France, the Netherlands, and Great Britain 
Uh, and you see each of those in the Netherlands, we prefer to serve it from the Netherlands, but if those servers are down or unreachable, then use this, the regular pool. Uh, so that's the map you define, uh, and then you do your resources. Uh, so you, know, you say which map to use, you set up the services that you want to monitor, and then we map that, those data centers we created, like North America, and we say, you know, server in Seattle, its IP, Los Angeles, Phoenix, Dallas, and so on. And then Europe. Uh, the other advantage we get here is, unlike in Bind, where we had the problem you can't have, in a round robin, you can't have the same IP twice, because uh, it just creates it into a hash. Uh, here, we can have the same IP twice to double up the load. To do, accomplish that in Bind, we basically had to have two different IPs on the machine to be able to double up. Uh, and we have a naming convention here that uh, factors in a little bit later. And then for your monitoring, you just, uh, we're just using the HTTP status module, but you can, there are a few others and you can write your own. Uh, we set the vhost in the path and so on. But importantly, we have the thresholds here. So we only consider a server up if the last 10 checks in a row have all returned the up status. So if one of those checks in the middle somewhere returned a down status, the server's still not up. Uh, if the server was in the danger state, which happens as soon as there's one failure, but before there's enough failures to be down, then it takes five good checks in a row to get back to the up state. So if a server's being monitored and it has one failure, it drops from up to danger, then once it has five goods again, it's back to up. Once a server has had two downs uh, in the monitoring period, then it moves from the danger state to down. And then we pull it out of the pool and stop returning it to users so that they're not going to a server that's either too busy or not even up. The nice thing about this is it's something that is pushed out from the uh, actual location of where the application is. So this is all happening in DNS, and you're directing clients. Um, really, you're anticipating your application health uh, as this happens. Um, one thing we haven't mentioned is that you actually get a statistics output from GDNSD. Um, sorry, we don't have an example of it, but um, that's also there's useful. A, there's a little web server built into GDNSD that lets you see the status of everything, and it uh, also has a CSV output, which we make use of. Uh, so we've created a couple of uh, custom monitoring modules. Uh, or they're on the, not as part of GDNSD, they're just uh, on our side. And so for a video server, you hit a certain HTTP URL, and it checks how much bandwidth the server's putting out right now. And once that's over a threshold, our HTTP provider returns an error 500 instead of a 200 OK, and that marks the server as down. So when a server is too busy, it gets marked as down, and we direct this traffic elsewhere. And we do the same thing for uh, HTTP, except for we check disk I.O. Because uh, after a cold reboot, our varnish cast is hitting the disk so hard that it starts causing uh, latency for responses. Uh, so all that worked until we ran into the situation where we don't have enough servers for the amount of bandwidth we need anymore. Uh, so we could fail over to a different region, but we kind of wanted to avoid that. So uh, I came up with the hate algorithm, high availability through EC2. <laughs> yes. We hate to use Amazon because they actually charge more per gigabit than, or per gigabyte than we do. So using them costs us money. So we really hate to do that. But we hate being down even more. So we wrote a little capacity manager script that basically pulls the CSV stats interface of the DNS server and checks the health of all of our servers. And because of our naming convention, we can tell that, look, we're, you know, 80% of our servers in Europe are marked as down because of load. So we need to get some more capacity in Europe right away. So call the Amazon EC2 API, Europe spin up some FreeBSD uh, EC2s, and they come up and uh, start taking over. Basically, we have the elastic IPs, which are basically static IPs that can move between virtual machines. And they're set up as the very last data center on the list for each region. Normally, they're all down. 
Uh, but once we start them and boot them up, they start coming up and all the load goes to Amazon. Uh, and then once our servers are back up, uh, you know, the event's over or whatever, we pull the, uh, our HTTP provider on each of those servers and check how many viewers are still using Amazon. Once that falls below a threshold of about 10 or so, once the server's quiet again, we can kill off those Amazon instances to save money. Uh, so in conclusion, we found that, uh, especially with HTTP, distance uh, adds latency, and that can hurt our object delivery for HTTP. Uh, especially because HTTP has a couple of round trips, and uh, usually the objects are so small, it's not transfer time that's killing us. It's just the setup of the sockets and uh, things like that. Uh, we also found that video performance lags if we have TCP retransmits. Because Flash and HLS especially are over TCP, they pause if there's a missed packet and have to wait for it. And so trying to avoid that as much as possible makes a big difference. Uh, and proximity to the user, we already said that. Uh, the proximity is less important uh, for video because once your connection's been alive for 10 seconds, it's usually settled down a bit. Uh, but the closer to the user we are, the more reliable the packet transmission is. So it means better quality video. And yes, we found that our cache warming, once we had millions of objects in our varnish, when you cold restart varnish, it hits the disk really hard. So having back off the traffic on that as when the disk starts to get busy, and then ease it back in one, and a couple of times until the cache is hot. Okay. And, uh, um, it, just to wrap it up, because we, we are almost done. Um, uh, uh, this is a solution that fits in the wonderful world of limitations. And so you, you're good at running FreeBSD servers. You create a solution uh, using what you're good at. Um, and uh, so it's an application layer solution. Um, it, we find it means having lots of network transit providers. We we get to leverage that and 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 make things better um, by uh, making it an advantage instead of a limitation. If we lose transit, we can drop something out, and a lot of times something goes down because of poor transit. Um, so we get to automatically recover. Uh, we get to distribute. Um, we have this complete global view of services, and uh, we get to uh, stage uh, the distribution. Right, so we have uh, load stages. So uh, especially for live video, because of we're doing like an origin edge type setup, we have an origin server, and that has to feed one copy of the stream to each edge server. Uh, when we only have, say, 100 viewers watching a stream, it's not advantageous to spread those out over 70 servers, because that means we're taking 70 copies of the origin stream. So uh, Certain customers are on an elastic pool that uses a, a smaller number of servers, and then once the, if the load goes high there, then it kicks over to using the rest of the network so that we have some level of efficiency uh, in, under lower load as well. And so we use that list of data centers to say, use the small pool, and then once that's full, use the medium pool, and then switch to the full pool. OK. Um, and I think uh, if there is a question, we could uh, take a Question or two, and uh, yeah. Uh, you may want to have a look at a thing called BGP DNS. Um, I did that ten years ago, about, and uh, you can find it uh, through a simple Google search, and it uses BGP information for the uh, proximity. Um, of the client instead of doing this geolocation stuff. Cool. Too bad I didn't find that before. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, maybe I missed a small detail, but I don't understand why you need to manually configure uh, Google with JYP. Can you just look at the EDNS? Uh, information and always use that to... Ah, to right. I, I did uh, miss to say that. Um, Google doesn't send the eDNS client subnet information unless you're on their whitelist of servers that support it. They didn't want to risk breaking the internet. So unless you're on Google's very, very small whitelist of uh, 
authoritative servers, then they won't send the client subnet to you. So you don't have that information and yeah. Yeah, so you don't have that information. So what we do is we have, uh, from Google, we found a post that Google put out, a list of all of their DNS servers and the actual location. And so we do an override in the, of the GeoIP information for that list of Google servers and for the list of uh, open DNS servers. Did you check what it takes to get onto that whitelist? Yeah, it's not that easy. <laughs> so they're like, email us at a fasterinternet.com, but then they, they don't really get back to you. And what's the value of the TTLs you're uh, sending out to the clients? Uh, usually our TTL is about five minutes because we want to have really fast. And uh, we have like eight of these GDNS servers, so we're not really worried about the DNS load. We'd rather have a high DNS load than to have uh, a longer TTL where we serve up a, a dead IP for 10 minutes or something. Okay. We need it to be short because you know, our, our load for video can spike by 10 gigabits in five minutes. So we need to be able to reposition that traffic very, very quickly. Okay. So it's not fun when certain ISPs impose a minimum TTL. Any other questions? Do you want to list those ISPs? I, I don't have a list. If somebody does, I would like to know so I could shoot them. Uh, does the uh, stats web page, uh, does it also show uh, st statistics of the queries, uh, the NS queries, or only of the uh, uh, load balancing? Some stats. Can you pull that up really quick? Uh, GDNS. I don't remember what port it's on. It's on a weird port. Uh, we're going to pull up the stats page really quick so you can see, but any other questions? Okay, thanks. Someone over here had a question, didn't they? Ah, so here's the stats page. You can see we see how many responses we had with no errors, how many we refused because they were silly. Uh, people looking up stuff that doesn't exist, drop packets. You can see that most of our queries, it's at 13.6 uh, million out of 17.8, support eDNS, which is the uh, packet up to 4096K, or 4096 bytes, but we don't know how many of those are behind a firewall that's actually going to block it if we tried to use it. Uh, and then we see the UDP requests. How many, uh, you can see only 120 TCP requests out of 17.8 million requests since the server rebooted 3.6 days ago. And then you see here's our monitoring. You see certain servers are up, certain servers are down. Uh, and there's also a, an orange danger state. Uh, but mostly we're up right now. And uh, so a danger state is a server that has had a failure, but not enough to be actually considered down because sometimes you have just a small hiccup or whatever. We use a very short timeout, so sometimes it's just there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.